Good morning, brethren. Welcome to the sanctuary this morning. Today is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. <laughs> we have a lot of reasons to celebrate this morning. And as we sang this morning in worship and praise, we sang, Jesus is king of the kingdom. He is king of the kingdom, the rightful heir to the throne. And he is also our lawgiver. He has given us his royal law of love. And if you've repented of your old way of life and you have surrendered to the king of kings, hallelujah, Jesus, and you are a member of God's royal household and a citizen of his eternal kingdom, and that is the best news ever. You are a royal priesthood, a child of the living God. Amen. The kingdom of God is your hope and it is our future. And nobody has anything like that. That's, that, that's just the best thing going. So we have a lot to celebrate. Let's go ahead and pray for our children as they prepare to leave for their classes. Father God, we just love you so much. We're so grateful for every gift, every good and perfect gift comes from you. And your word says that children are a blessing from the Lord. So we receive them as your gift to us, Lord God. But we know that they are really your children. They belong to you and you've placed us into, that you've placed them into our care so that we could raise them to know you, to love you, and to serve you all the days of their lives, Lord God. So, Father, we pray that you would anoint the teachers, that you would go before them, and that you would cause the seed of your word to bear much fruit in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 31 through 33, he said, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But instead... Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you or given to you as well. So don't worry. God knows what you need, and he knows what you need before you do. He knows that you need water, clean water to drink. He knows you need food, healthy food. He knows that you need a place to live, shelter, clothes, those things. And he's a good father. He's a good, good father. He doesn't gamble away his paycheck every weekend or drink it all up and come home drunk and beat his wife and kids. He's a good father. Some of people have a hard time understanding how good God is. And he takes care of all of his children. Instead of worrying and trying to figure out how we're going to make it on our own, how we're going to have enough money to pay for all the bills, Jesus tells us to do this. He says, seek first and foremost above all other things the kingdom of God. In fact, that's the only thing you need to seek. And his righteousness. Seek God, his kingdom, and his righteousness, which is found in Jesus Christ. You cannot be righteous any apart from Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, like dirty diapers, poopy diapers. That's what our righteousness looks like, smells like. It's disgusting to a holy God. Amen? So... We've already learned, we've been talking about the kingdom of God, because if you're going to seek it, uh, you need to know what you're looking for. We talked about that before, and we're trying to learn what this kingdom of God really looks like. And uh, so we've already learned in the first two sessions, first is that Jesus is the king of his kingdom. He's the rightful king. He, he is the firstborn son of God, and he is the heir to the kingdom, and he is the rightful king of the, God's kingdom, and we are his subjects. We are the citizens of God's kingdom. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. Amen? We've also learned in the second session that God's kingdom has laws. All kingdoms have laws. Y'all get that? Every kingdom, every state, every nation has laws, and we're expected to follow those laws. And God's kingdom is no different. As his citizens, we are empowered to, by his grace, to live a life of love and, and, and obey his laws because they're all rooted in law, in love. His, his laws come from the heart of God, which is love. So we learned that the evidence that we love Jesus, the fruit, the evidence, you say you're a Christian. Well, the evidence is that you obey his commands. And that's found in John 14, 23. And 24, it says, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. Not might, not maybe. He will 
obey my teaching. If you love Jesus, you're going to have fruit. And it's, it's going to be that you love, you're going to um, obey his teachings. Father, he says, my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So anyone who says they're a Christian and refuses to obey the laws of God is not really a Christian. They may have head knowledge. They may have been convinced who Jesus is. Well, the devil and the demons know who Jesus is. They're still going to be thrown into the lake of fire. It's not enough to know who Jesus is. We must be converted. In other words, Changed from one person to another, like a, a, a caterpillar into a butterfly. You're completely, you look totally different. And so in 1 John 5, verse 1 through 3, it says, everyone, not some, not the pastor, not some particular missionary, but everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves his child or loves his child as well. This is how we, this is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God. This is what it looks like to obey his commands. And I want to just uh, talk about this for just one second. It says everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Again, that's not just head knowledge. That is heart knowledge. It has gone from here to the heart, to the inner being of a human being, and it transforms your life. So how do you know somebody is a Christian or loves God? This is love for God. This is what it looks like to obey his commands. Now, Jesus tells us that we can't do this on our own. We can't love God and we can't love our neighbor as ourselves. He tells us we must remain in him if we're going to bear the fruit of love in our lives. We can't do it on our own. And that's found in John 15, verse 4. He says, Jesus says this, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So Jesus says you've got to remain in Christ. If you're going to bear the fruit of love in your life. I, I don't know about you, but every once in a while I go out in my yard and I cut off the dead branches off my fruit trees. And I always look at the branches. Is there any green on here? If it's got green on it, I'm not going to cut it off. It means there's still life in it. But if it doesn't have any green in it and it's real brittle, heck, I could just knock it off. With my finger. It's dead. It has no life in it. So it looks like it's attached to the tree. And it still is. But there's no life flowing through it. And it dies. We must remain in Christ. And he says, how do we do that? He tells us. John 15 verse 9 through 12. As the Father has loved me. This is how you do it. As you, the Father has loved me, Jesus says this, so have I loved you, now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just in the same way as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this. So that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. So if you were not here for the past two teachings on the kingdom of God, which we're studying. Please go to our YouTube channel, which is called Sanctuary Church of Jacksonville to watch them. And also, while you're doing that, go ahead and like the, the, the YouTube that you're watching, the video, and share it on your social media, and then subscribe to our channel. This will help get the word out. We're, we're teaching on the kingdom of God. And you know what? That was a command of Jesus. He said, go out and, and preach the good news of the kingdom. So you, have a, 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 you can do this now. 
You can go preach the kingdom by simply sharing our teachings on the kingdom. So please do that. Preach the kingdom of God. So today we're going to look at the kingdom of God in a totally different light. We've been talking about the government of God's kingdom. The government is that Jesus is the king. All authority has been given to him to rule and reign over the kingdom. He is also the lawgiver. He's the one that is the law. He's the word of God. Amen. And now we're going to talk to him as Jesus is the judge. So you've got the king, the lawgiver, and the judge. This is the government of God's kingdom. So I'm going to talk about justice. Every nation or kingdom must establish a system of justice. Because laws without accountability are of no effect. Laws with, you know, um, my understanding is um, Walmart's moving out of Portland, Oregon. Because you know why? People can shoplift and they can't do anything about it. They won't even be charged for the crime. There's no accountability. There's a law that says you can't steal. But if you can get away with it, who, who cares? What good is the law, right? And so today, in our nation, we have lawlessness. Because lawbreakers are not being punished according to their crimes. But we're going to learn how this works in the world kingdom and in God's kingdom. It's totally different. So... The judicial branch of government has the authority and the power to administer justice. However, in the world, justice, justice is very rarely achieved. Hardly ever. Justice is perverted when the laws are unjust. Start there. If the laws are unjust, justice is perverted. Justice is also perverted because man's heart is full of evil, deceit, and, de and bad, and it's horrible. So, justice requires that the law be applied to everyone across the board. And all people must be held accountable to the law. So, true justice in this world requires... That the court the, in the courtroom requires that the judge, the witnesses, the jury, and the law be righteous. In other words, they have righteous intent. So even in the even the intent of the prosecuting attorney and the defense attorneys must be righteous. Well, that's very seldom. You got. Prosecuting attorneys, prosecuting innocent people like the January 6th people who have been in prison for over two years. Without a fair trial. That's not justice. Why are they prosecuting them? Unjust, unjustly. They were, they're evil. Evil people. Supporting an evil regime. And then you got your defense attorneys that, 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 that defend cold-blooded murderers. And they look for every loophole to try to get them out of going to the gas chamber. And then when somebody does a heinous crime and they're released after a year, that's not justice. You see how impossible, almost impossible for true justice to occur in today's world, in today's society. But God insists on justice. God is a God of justice. He's a just God. And Exodus 23 verse 2 through 7 tells us this. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit. Do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor man in his lawsuit. Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death for I will not acquit the guilty. So God is going to hold people guilt, uh, accountable for how they participate in administering justice. He will. Le Leviticus 19 verse 15 says, do not pervert justice. 
do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great. Either one. For judge your neighbor fairly. In Deuteronomy 16 verse 19 through 20 it says, again, do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Follow justice and justice alone so that you may live and possess the land your, the Lord your God is giving you. Boy, we mess that up in this country. Huh, it's terrible. Zechariah 7 verse 9 through 10 says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. This is what he says. So I think we should listen. He says, administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. That's what God says about justice. So in the kingdom of God, justice does prevail because God's laws are perfect. They are just. And the judge of his kingdom is perfect. There won't be a jury. The prosecuting attorney will be Satan. Jesus is our lawyer, our defense attorney, our advocate. We win. Amen? But in the kingdom of God, the judge of the kingdom is perfect. Sinners will be punished and the righteous will receive their reward. That's the great news. Because God requires justice and he will repay every man according to his own deeds. That's found in Ezekiel 18 verse 30 through 32. It says this. Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you. I will judge you. Each one according to his ways declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all of your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. God wants us to. To turn from our wicked ways which leads to death. He says turn and live. Amen. God is a God of life. He says choose life. I set before you life and death. Blessing and curses. Choose life. Just remember those words. Choose life. Romans 2 verse 5 through 11 says. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart. You are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed. You know, when my dad, he watches all this news, horrible stuff on the news. I said, and he gets all angry. He's got, you know, he's 95 years old. He doesn't have anything to do. Nobody to talk to. So he's got the television on. I said, daddy, please. All those wicked people, they're going to burn in hell forever. Unless they repent. I'm telling you. You don't have to worry about it. God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Vengeance is mine. There's no reason to get upset. Do not fret when you see evil men prosper in their ways. Psalm 37. Don't fret when you see them prospering in their ways. Because in the end, they're going to be like the grass that withers and dies and thrown into the fire. But instead, just do good. Just serve the Lord. But God says, God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality. We do good. We persist. We're persistent in doing good. Because we seek the glory, honor, and immortality when he gives us eternal life, an eternal, eternal life in a glorified body, in an eternal kingdom. This is what seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness means. And why 
we do it. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. I cannot imagine being someone who is, has rejected Christ and sold themselves to the devil as they stand before a holy and righteous judge, Jesus. And when they see him in all of his glory, they will fall on their faces and beg for mercy. But it will be too late. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. We have a chance to do it today. Or we can wait before the throne of the white throne, the great white throne. One or the other. It says there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. In other words, God is not a respecter of persons. He's not going to show favoritism to the Jews. He says, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. So our righteous judge is Jesus Christ. Amen. He rightfully sits on the throne of judgment because he has not only given us the law, but he completely and perfectly obeyed his own law. He is the only man who completely obeyed the law of God. He alone is sinful and only he can perfectly judge the hearts of men. You know, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, that's Jesus. He's the only one. He's the only one without sin. Amen. Isaiah 16 verse 5 says, In love a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it. Now, this was written 800 years or so before the birth of Christ. Isaiah the prophet says, in love, a throne, it's where a king sits, will be established. In faithfulness, a man, Jesus Christ, will sit on it. One from the house of David. Yes, he was a descendant of King David. One who in judging seeks justice. And speeds the cause of righteousness. Hallelujah. We can rest assured that every single wicked person that you see out there today on the news. Or down the street. Or in your workplace. Unless they repent. They will face justice. Acts 17 verse 31 says. For he has set a day. When he will judge the world with justice. Perfect justice. Nobody's going to get away with anything. By the man he is appointed. And that's Jesus. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So that's how we know it's Jesus. Amen. John 5 verse 26 and 27 says this. For as the father has life in himself. So he has granted the son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge. Because he is the, he is the son of man. So Jesus was born from the Holy Spirit, he's God, but he was born of the Virgin Mary, he's human. And in his humanity, he perfectly obeyed the law of God. He's the only one that can judge us. How could God judge sinful men no, if he had never experienced what we go through in this world that is so under the, has always been under control of the, and dominion of demonic activity? And of course, the heart, the heart, the human heart is evil. The human heart has the capacity to do the wickedest, the most vilest of sins. Jesus had to come to earth. He had to live under the same rules we have, in the same circumstances, the same world we live in. And he had to obey the word perfectly so that he could be the perfect lamb of God who was slain. His blood paid the price for all of us. Acts 10 verse 39 through 43 tells us this. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Speaking about Jesus. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. 
He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. By us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. What were they told to testify? Jesus commanded them, the disciples, the apostles, to preach to the people and to testify that Jesus is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Wow. He's not just our merciful Savior. He's also going to judge the living and the dead. God has promised that the day is coming when all sin, all sin, Satan and evil men, women, men and women will be destroyed. In accordance with his righteous wrath. God is love. Of course he is. That's his character. And that's why he hates sin. Because sin. The, the fruit is death. And also. Sin destroys your life. You're watching it around. You just watch it. It's happening at an astronomical rate. It is unbelievable how far our nation has fallen since I was in school. We would have never dreamed about the conversations that we're having today in 1950. Or even 1960 when we had the sexual revolution. Hello. We would have never dreamed of the conversations we're having today. But he says in Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15. Then I saw John, the apostle. He's on the island of Patmos. He has been exiled there by the Roman government for being a, a witness of Jesus. He says, then I saw, he saw a vision. He was taken to heaven. It wasn't even a vision. He actually was taken to heaven. He said, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for him, for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. You see, the dead will be raised to see Jesus, but not in a good way, to be judged. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of, the, of life. So there's two books, the book of life. Hmm. And the book's got all the, everything recorded in it. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades, the holding place for the dead who are not in Christ. They gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So God is not only a just God. He is also love. And because of his great love for us, he extended his hand of mercy and made a way of escape for all who would believe and trust in him. Because, folks, every one of us deserve the second death. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Some of us more than others. We all deserve death. We deserve death. But God loved us. He says that 
Micah 7 verse 18, who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. It's God's mercy. God is a merciful God. It's his character to show mercy. And all of us need mercy. All of us need God's mercy. I do. Luke 150 says, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And you can believe the watered down version of that that's been taught in our nation for decades. Or you can go to um, our website and look up the sermon that I taught on the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it keeps you from sinning. It, it helps you turn to God. It's a healthy thing. But go to that website. Go to our website. Look it up. There's a great teaching on that. And I, let me tell you, most of what I teach is all coming from the scriptures. 90% of it. But he says he extends mercy to those who fear him from generation to generation. In Romans 5 verse 8 it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Praise God. While we were still in rebellion against him, living a sinful life, doing the horrific things we've done, breaking every commandment there is, he loved us enough to send Jesus to die for our sins. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 and 16 says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy. So that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example of those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. You know, uh, I've watched videos of people, men or women who were into the occult. They were actually Satanists. There, I've seen one of a Satanic priest who came to Christ. I think there's a singer from the band called Kiss. Corn, corn. I never listened to it because I was, I never listened to that kind of music. But this guy, you look at him and you think, oh yeah, he's a sinner. He's going to hell. No chance in heaven. He's going to heaven. But I'm going to tell you, the man's saved. Completely restored to God. Living a life pleasing to God. Why? Because God loves to save the sinners. And he's not a respecter of person. And you know what? You get somebody who's been a prostitute, a drug dealer, a, a gang leader, a murderer, and they get saved. Let me tell you, they're going to be the best Christian ever. They're going to be out there preaching the gospel. And people are going to be saying, wow, if God could do that to him, what can he do for me? Amen? God loves to do this. That's why Paul said that. John 3.16, we know this scripture, 16 and 8 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his own, one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. You see, we are already condemned to death. What does that word condemn mean? When you go to prison because you've murdered someone or you go to the judge, you're, you're being prosecuted for a crime that's deserving of death. Well, in this world, you could get away with it. But what if you couldn't? And you go into that courtroom. You deserve the death penalty. You're already condemned. They got 20 witnesses. Uh, they're going to they're gonna condemn you. They're going to condemn you. They're going to convict you. They're going to condemn you to death. But you know, as sinners born into this world with a sin nature, we're already condemned. We needed a savior. We couldn't save ourselves. 
Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Simply because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So what good news we have in Jesus? Praise the Lord. This is the great news of the gospel. As citizens of the kingdom of God, born into the family of God, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, we have received forgiveness for our sins. And the verdict from the judge is not guilty. Praise God. Not guilty. When we stand before the judge, he's going to say, not guilty. Now, I want y'all to put yourself in this sh position. Pretend like you're facing a judge today and you have committed a crime worthy of the death sentence, death penalty. And, and the judge gave you a verdict. And everybody knows you're guilty, but the judge says not guilty. Because someone who loved you chose to take upon himself not only the guilt, but the punishment for what you did. I'd say that would be a time to celebrate, don't you? Man, wouldn't you, that just make you love that person more? I mean, like, this person loves you. Maybe you don't love that person. Maybe you don't even know them. But when you find out that that person took all your guilt upon themselves and then took the punishment, death, on your behalf, and you're now not guilty, you walk away free of charge. You walk out that courtroom a free man or woman. You don't even have it on your record that you were arrested. It's all been washed away. Wiped clean. You had a clean record. Nobody will ever know that you actually did commit a murder or whatever the crime was. But that should cause us to have some kind of response towards the person who would do that for us. Amen? Amen. You know, because God has extended mercy and forgiveness to us for our own rebellion and disobedience... I'll tell you what our response must be. It, and it's a must. It's, we're required to extend mercy and forgiveness to everyone who's offended us. That is a law of the kingdom of God. It is a law of the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. And Matthew 5 verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall or will be shown mercy. In addition, God says in Micah 6 through 8, He says, God has shown us, O man. It says he, but that's God. God has shown you, O man, what is good. What does God consider good? And what does God require of you? Here's what he requires of us. To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, I've taught on this before. I can tell you that a humble person is going to be merciful. Because we know that we've sinned against God and we need God's mercy. And I'm sure we've offended and hurt other people and we need their mercy. So you're going to be humble and you're going to be merciful. And as a result of that, your actions will be just. Because it's impossible for an unmerciful person, a person who is filled with bitterness and unforgiveness, that person will not live a life that's pleasing to God. Impossible. Hosea 6 verse 6 tells us, for God, I... Speaking God, God speaking, he says, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. So in the Old Testament, they came to the temple or the tabernacle. They made offerings of the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and lambs. And they did all this sacrificing, killing an animal, pouring the blood on the altar. 
And, and, you know, you come into the house of God and, and, and you put your money on the ta- in the basket. That's a sacrifice. That's an act of worship. But God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That's not, he, he desires that we be like him. And God is merciful. Amen. It's his character. Jesus also instructed us in Matthew 1 and 2, 1 ver, verse 1 and 2. He said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So if you're teeny tiny little bit merciful, you're going to get very little mercy from anyone else because you reap what you sow. If you're very judgmental, other people are going to judge you harshly. You see. But he says, do not judge. In other words, don't sit in the seat of the judge who has the power to extend mercy or judgment, condemnation. In other words, do not condemn people in their sin. Let me tell you, when I see, when I see people in their sin, when I see a homosexual, when I see a transgender, My heart's filled with compassion. I don't judge them. I know God can save them. He saved many. Look on YouTube. You'll see lots of videos of people who have totally been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't judge anyone because there but by the grace of God go I. You see, I was raised in a wonderfully loving home. Not perfect, but I had a loving mom and dad. I, I didn't grow up in a horrific home environment. And I don't know what those people have been through in their childhood. Most of them in terrible, terrible childhoods. Bad bad things happening to little sweet innocent children. And then they grow up to be really messed up. They don't know who they are. They don't know who they are. And they're deceived. So we don't judge. We don't condemn the lost. We pray for them. We love them. We're merciful to them. Luke 6 verse 37 says, do not judge and you will not be judged. You're not the judge. Jesus is. Do not condemn. See, this is what he's talking about. You don't talk bad about people because they're living in sin. You pray for them for in the same way. uh, He says, do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Folks, I don't want to be condemned. I want to be, I want God's mercy. Right now, Jesus is sitting on the throne and he's, ex, he's sitting on the mercy seat where he's extending mercy to everyone who would believe. He says, forgive and you will be forgiven. Well, what does it mean if you don't forgive? You won't be forgiven. Can you get to heaven if you're not forgiven? I wouldn't want to take the chance. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, your heavenly father won't forgive you. You know, I really believe one reason the enemy comes at us with people doing horrible things to us is to get us to the place where we refuse to forgive them. In direct rebellion against what God says we must do. This is what he requires of us to be merciful. We're not the judge. Jesus is. Right now he's seated on the mercy seat. He's already paid the penalty for every single sin, every single person on the planet through all generations ever committed. All the wrath of God was poured out onto Jesus for every single sin committed. Horrible sins. Horrific sins. And this is what James tells us that we need to do in response to that. He says in James 2, 12 through 13, he says, speak, you guys, we need to all listen to this. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law, which means the the royal law of love. We're going to be judged by God's royal law of love that gives freedom Because God's law of love gives freedom for the captives. You see, when we hold on to offenses, we um, 
cause people to be captive to their sin. But when we forgive them, whatever is loosed on earth is loosed in the heavenlies. So when we forgive someone, we allow God's, God to come to the rescue. To rescue that person from their sin. Bring them, convict them of sin. Bring them to re, a place of repentance. Because that's what the ministry of reconciliation is all about. That's what we're called to be. So he says we're to speak, not go around gossip and talk bad about somebody. But speak blessing over them. Speak the word of God over them. Whatever God tells us to do. Speak and act as if we're going to be judged by the law of love. Because judgment without mercy. Listen to this. With judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Oh my gosh. Does the church need to hear this? Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's through mercy and forgiveness that people are set free. Yes, even that husband who's doing horrible things. Or that wife. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James 3 verse 13 through 18 tells us this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by his good life. By deeds done in, hum in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where you have selfish Envy and selfish ambition. There you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Peace loving. Loves peace. Doesn't want to be arguing all the time. Doesn't love drama. Doesn't demand their own way. Doesn't force his way or her way on everybody else. It's peace loving. It's considerate. It, it considers the needs of others. And it's submissive. It doesn't lord its will over anyone else. It's submissive. We submit to one another as unto the Lord. And it's full of mercy and good fruit. You see, good fruit cannot come from a bad tree. Mercy and good fruit, they come together. They're two sides of the same coin. This wisdom from heaven is impartial. It doesn't take sides. It doesn't show favoritism. And it's sincere. It's real. It's not fake. It's not phony. It's the real deal. And then it says, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And then God will take care of everything else in your life. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5 verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. You know, little rock looks exactly like his dad. He's got a lot of the same personality characteristics. He's got the sweetness of his mom, the gentle spirit of his mommy. You know that Little Rock belongs to Rocky and Sessie because he looks like them. He acts like them. He talks like them. Amen. We want to look like Jesus. We want to look like our Heavenly Father. We want to talk like him. We want to act like it. We want people when they say, oh, I know Connie and Dwight. Man, they, they look just like their father. I love there was a song back in the, when I was a baby Christian. Is, She's got her father's eyes. 
and ba- I don't remember the words, but it's basically eyes that see the good in people. Do we have our Father's eyes? Do we see things? Do we see the world through His eyes? You want to look and act and talk like a child of God? You must be a peacemaker. Not a peacekeeper. A peacemaker. A peacekeeper is somebody who just avoids conflict. A peacemaker, if you know your brother is angry with you, you go to that person and try to make peace. If you know two people are angry with each other, you go to those people and you try to make peace. You do what you can. Seek peace. You seek peace in your home. You seek peace in your marriage. You seek peace in the workplace. Or do you cause conflict? We need to be peacemakers. And you can't do that unless you have the mind of Christ. You get that when you get the wisdom from heaven. And in order to have that, you got to be full of mercy. And good fruit. If you're not merciful, you don't have the mind of Christ. Because it is impossible to bear fruit, good fruit, unless we are merciful, period, end of subject. So let's what, let us remember what the Apostle Paul told us in Titus 3, verse 3 through 7. He says, at one time, we too were foolish. At one time, you know why we shouldn't be judgmental against people in the world? At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved, By all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy. Oh yeah. Being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. He saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done. But because of his mercy. He saved us. Through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified, made right with God by his grace. We might become heirs. Having the hope of eternal life. As the merciful judge, Jesus is calling us to mercy To receive his mercy and then to extend his mercy to those who have offended us. The question is, are you willing? Because it's an act of the will. It's an act of our will. I choose to forgive. I may not feel like it. My feelings don't want to do exactly what Jesus wants me to do. But I choose. I make a decision to forgive those who sin against me. Not only that, Jesus said to love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Do good to those who hate you. Repay evil with goodness. If your enemy is thirsty, give him a glass of water to drink. Bless those who curse you. Are you willing? Are you willing? Make a decision today. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Amen. I need God's mercy. You know, we've been studying the kingdom of God and his government. Isaiah 33 verse 22 really sums it up very well. Written approximately over 800 years before the birth of Christ, it says, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you, I was reading on Facebook. Um, I'm on a page from Australia. And there's a lot of Christians that post on there. But there's a lot of people that have really messed up. And they're talking about all the problems with around the world. I won't say it because I'll get blackballed off YouTube. And this one guy says, we're going to have to save ourselves. Really? 
Mankind has to save the earth. Mankind has to save us from all the wickedness in the world. No, we can't. We needed a Savior, and we have one. Praise God that I'm not looking for this earth for any man or political party or anything to save this country. I'm looking forward to a, I pray for it, and I'm going to vote properly. But I'm going to tell you, my hope is not in this world. It is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. And he is preparing a kingdom for us that is eternal. It is pure. It is holy. It is just. There will be no wickedness in it. It's going to be awesome and glorious. That's my hope. That's my future. And that's why I have peace in the midst of all that I see. It's why I have joy in my life. No matter what comes my way, I know the end of the story. And now you do too. Praise God. Let's all make a decision to be merciful. Amen? And bear lots of good fruit. So let's pray. And by the way, if you've been here for any length of time, you know Teresita and Marcus, their family that came here for many years, but then they moved away in Pensacola. And this is uh, Sassy's aunt. And Marcus passed away this past week. And... Um, it, and, and he wants to be in, have a mem memorial service here in, in, in the sanctuary. And so when we find out when they want to have it, we'll let everyone know. But they were a very precious family to us and still are. So I want you all to keep them in your prayers. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just come before your throne of grace and mercy. We thank you for extending your scepter of mercy to us, God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who brought us to conviction our, that, that we were sinning against you. That you brought us to conviction of sin and that you brought us to the place of repentance. Turning away from sin. Of surrendering our life of sin. To seek you. To seek your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. That you did not leave us in that place of desolation, hopelessness, darkness. Thank you, God, that you took us by the hand and you lifted us out of the mar miry pit of slime and so, so, so nasty sin. Thank you, God, for taking us out of the darkness into the light, into your glorious presence. Thank you for Changing our minds and changing our hearts, God. We're incapable of doing it ourselves. We only can do it through your power, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you've set our feet on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And you've given us an inheritance that will never pass away. Thank you, God. Well, Father, I just pray right now that you would... Do a heart, a work in our hearts to forgive every single person. Bring it to our memory of any offense we are holding on to. Any insult. Any, anything that's ever done, been done. Betrayals, abandonments, lies, cheating, stealing. Everyone who's ever harmed us in any way. Help us to forgive, first and foremost, our parents for their failings. Oh, God, have mercy. Help us to forgive and be merciful because you're merciful, God. Heal the broken places in our hearts. Pull up the root of bitterness that has taken over our lives. And plant the seed of your love in our lives so that it creates a great big tree that bears the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, Father, we admit we can't save ourselves. And we can't. All we can do is agree. All we can do is surrender. And be willing to forgive. And I guess, God, you have to do the rest. Lord, we want to love our enemies and we 
that's impossible apart from you. But you loved us when we were your enemies. So do something in us, God, that changes us, God. Fill us with your mercy. Cause us to become gracious and kind to those who hate us. And use us, God, to be ministers of reconciliation, reconciling others, yes, even our enemies, back to you. Let your kingdom come, your kingdom, your mighty kingdom come. Rule and reign in our hearts and our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have need of prayer, I'm going to invite you to come forward for prayer. If you're having a problem forgiving anyone, just come on up here. We'll talk to you. We'll pray for you. We'll take you before the throne of grace and let God do his thing. And if you have offerings for the poor, for our missions, or your tithes, please bring them to the altar. In Jesus' name, amen.